Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gloostick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and fantasy world history videos on my channel. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel by clicking the join button below or backing me on Patreon where you can get access to all of the scripts I write for these vids, advanced access to my videos and of course subscribing to me here as I upload at least twice a week and a live stream on the weekends. Halflings have one of the most interesting pantheons and their culture fascinates me. So let's explore it together, shall we? In this video, we will learn about hobbits' day-to-day -day lives and how common values unite their entire race. We will look at what other cultures think about the halfling pantheon and what the actual religious practices of the Shire folk are in comparison to the commonly held belief. I think you will find it uh, somewhat shocking at how much you didn't know. So settle back, grab yourself a beverage, we are about to get deeply nerdy. I think the first place to start is with a god that you will have heard of, but might not have realised is actually a part of the halfling pantheon, Timora, goddess of luck and fortune. For most of this video I'm going to be quoting and paraphrasing passages from the complete book of gnomes and halflings, demi-human deities, faiths and avatars, and an assortment of wiki articles that are drawn mostly from Dragon Magazine articles and campaign guides for the Forgotten Realms world setting, because a lot of these articles are very succinct, well spoken, and they convey all the information as well as I can. The halflings of the realms worship a pantheon of deities known collectively as Yondala's children, or at least that's what most tall folk assume that the halflings worship, and the halflings rarely correct them, as by and large it's close enough to the truth. Timora is a halfling goddess mostly worshipped by humans, not halflings, although Lady Luck is in some sense an interloper goddess within the halfling pantheon. The fragmented mythology of the small folk has allowed Timora to be included as a local goddess under a wide variety of guises in halfling communities across Toril, because there are a thousand tales of tricky, bold, and lucky halfling maidens across their folklore, and Timora is commonly seen by the small folk as a long-standing local deity who has simply conned the big folk into worshipping her as well, and who are they to interfere in the god's own business? Halflings are unlike humans in that they have a more immediate and local religion where there are small gods for every aspect of their surroundings and their life. The day-to-day -day beliefs of a halfling are not centred on the grand worship of Yondala and the few gods that humans and other folk know about. In truth, they don't know much about the halflings' real religious practices on a local level at all. It would simply confuse them and leave them wondering if the halflings actually have one religion, or every village has its own. So keep in mind that what I'm about to tell you is just one name and one version of a hundred names and a hundred variations on each god in the halfling pantheon. You can travel 10 miles and what was Yandala is the last in the last village is Yandorian in the next and on the island across the sea she's known as Galambarine. They are all essentially Yandala and the folk tales and mythology are more or less the same. So if the human says, oh that's Yandala right? The halfling will smile and nod and say, surely it is, and quietly think to themselves, this is the goddess as she's made herself known to us, and it's really of, only of concern to us if she has a thousand names and she has a thousand reasons for them, and none of them are for the small folk to question or concern themselves with. Be content and let others be, that's the halfling way. But for our purposes, and to make it easier to digest, let's just stick to the names the humans know, and first up, let's look at Timora, the Lady Luck. Timora is sometimes called Tyke's fair-haired or fair-tressed daughter or Bishaba's bright sister, but these are more poetic titles than designations of her maternal lineage or her hair colour, and these are human versions of Timora. In actuality, Timora is half the deity she once known as Tyke and Bishaba being the other half, in human culture at least, so she's kind of blended together out of those two concepts. Timora's faith is one of the most common in Faerun, in particular since she caters most heavily to a highly mobile, relatively wealthy, and intrinsically powerful group who live by their wits and by their luck, otherwise known as adventurers. Timora is fickle, but playful, and never vengeful or malicious. She likes a good joke, and has been known to play an occasional practical joke on some of the other more straight-laced Faerunian deities, such as Helm and Tyr. She is reputed by sages to have short-lived romances with several of the good male deities of Faerun, but these ended amicably on both sides after a short while. She likes merriment and festivities and occasions, and rumours abound at gaming houses throughout Faerun of people who spotted her at tables during holidays or some sort of celebration or a tavern, laughing and having a good time with all. So she mixes it up with mortals on occasion. 
Tamora rarely walks Faerun in physical form though. When she does appear as an avatar, her looks vary, it really depends on why she's manifesting and among whom. Before the time of troubles, she appeared among the humans as a boyish, crafty-faced brunette tomboy. Since appearing in the ladies' house in Arabelle during the God's War, she has preferred the form of a tall, thin, graceful woman with long, flowing, unbound platinum blonde hair and eyes like blue-black stars and a kind and regal face. So, quite different. To the halflings, she appears as a fit and healthy, athletic, harefoot maiden with lustrous and long curled brown hair, armed with a blade of silver that flows as a silver tear from her eye and then shapes itself into a plus three longsword in midair when she so desires. On the rare occasion that she lends one of her swords to a mortal uh, who is performing a service or undertaking a quest in her name, the sword functions as a plus one luck blade loaded with three wish spells. The faith of Tamora is incredibly diverse. She is the goddess of the bold and the brave, the daring and the adventurous, both good-hearted and bad people pray to her, paladins and criminals alike. Many of her temples are more like adventurers guilds that double as a place of worship. This suits Tamora just fine. Who knows how many have paid little heed to an attractive and pluckish halfling maiden who's drowning in ale and listening to, with interest, to a tale of adventure told by an adventuring bard, recounting the experiences of a group of heroes who just narrowly survived thanks to the Lady Luck herself. Temples of Tamora are beacons of hope to those who are in strange and desperate circumstances, where they don't really know where else to turn, but to those who seek trouble for its own sake. When manifesting on Faerun, Timroa often takes the form of a silver bird or a silver pegasus when she's not in humanoid form. She also sends servant creatures to aid mortals in these shapes, as well as those of the spirits of adventurers who were faithful to her in life and now dwell in her realm in the afterlife, including fairy dragons, Foo lions from Karatur, swan maize, and unicorns. When showing her favour for a particularly blessed gambler, she sometimes has been known to manifest as a silver glow about the gambler that's evident only to that person, not those around them. When this happens, something favourable will happen in regard to that wager, whether it's the wager of being more likely to win, or even the bet being forced to be called off in cases where the, the bet was rigged by the opposition. About as close as you can get to a seriously religious uh, body seeking to unite the Tamoran faith under one dogma is the movement within the kingdom of Cormio that started particularly in the city of Arabel, where the clergy is mostly, mostly made up of women in higher ranked positions. I won't go into much more detail on the specific priests and practices of Tamora's worship because in halfling communities they simply don't have any specifically to the goddess of that name. Much like any other people, the halflings pray for luck and they may pray for the god of sweet potatoes to grant them a good harvest free of pests. They may pray to the gods of carpentry and timber and the lake and fishing and weather to watch out for a newly made fishing boat, all of which has an element of wishing for good fortune and the rewards for risks of going out on the lake. And that, Tamora hears those prayers. Even if she's never mentioned by name, it's part of her portfolio. The myths of halfling gods are often interwoven with tales of their own folk heroes of earlier generations who are considered to embody the teachings or philosophy of one of those halfling pantheon or powers. Yondala is the protect protector and provider, or whatever local guise that may be. She's universally acknowledged to be the leader of the halfling pantheon who all work together in the collective fashion for the good of the whole race, often dispatching avatars in pairs or in groups together to work as needed to protect the halfling people. The closest the halflings have to an evil power is actually the gnomish god Erdlin, the crawler below, who is just as likely to tunnel up into halfling burrows as the homes of gnomes. The halfling gods are so alike in many ways that they're sometimes blended together within their folklore so that Yondala, Karolali, and perhaps even Sheila Peri Royal are all seen as aspects of the same power, kind of like you've got a summer, winter, and spring version of a goddess. The halflings are always always concerned with the immediate and the close to home. They don't pray to their gods to save the world from evil, but they will pray for the crackleberry souffle to rise and for it not to rain during a wedding ceremony. Halflings and gnomes are far more interested in worshipping an immediate and beneficent deity, one whose responsibilities are to them and no one else, rather than some abstract power who's supposed to be overseeing the whole race or the whole world. The remoteness of most human and even dwarven deities bewilders many halflings, as does the deference human worshippers show to these deities. Halflings respect the powers, but they're not in awe of them, partly because 
part of awe is fear, and they do not fear their powers. Halfling priests not only remind the community that they owe the gods some veneration, but they also remind the gods to honour their promises towards their followers. So the prayers of halflings are quite different in tone to that of a human, and this can be of a bit of a shock to humans who may not have experienced this fundamental difference before. It's a culture shock. When a halfling says the god owes them a favour, they actually mean it. Halfling history is maintained by oral tradition, telling stories, songs and poems. Thus, there is no real scholarly origin story for the race. You have to go around and collect all of these folk tales from halflings themselves. Nor do the halflings care about such a thing. Most halflings on Tyrol will claim the land of Lurin as their ancestral homeland. There is little in the southern nation's history or archaeology that suggests the halflings have been present there for more than 12 centuries. The history of Elf and Dwarf both claim that the genies who founded Kalimshan brought with them many human and halfling slaves, and that only dates back as far as minus 7,800 Dale Reckoning. I'll now flip open the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition sourcebook for Planescape titled On Hallowed Ground to page 111 and simply read what it has to say in the words of author Colin McComb, because he says very much in a short amount of space and really covers the Pantheon and their celestial home quite well, plus the attitude of the halflings as well. The comforts of hearth and home, a soft bed and the company of good friends, freedom from fear and need, the kindness of a word and the generosity of strangers, these are all held dear by the halflings, called the little folk. Is it any wonder then that their powers exemplify these qualities, promoting stability, safety and concern for all halflings above all else. Most of the creation myths of the halflings are unique among the races of the multiverse because they tell of a time where their people, without a god, found Yondala or Yondala found them and taught them the better methods of survival. Myths of other, other races usually tell of the gods creating the mortals or the people creating the gods. Very, very few legends suggest that each grew without the influence of the other. Of all the known races of the plains, only the halflings claim that they and their deities are together by mutual agreement, that the powers have as much obligation to the mortals as the mortals do to the powers. The halfling pantheon is one of the smallest across the plains, yet also one of the largest. See, only a few divine names are known to all halflings, but the residents of each burg or village place great importance on the local powers, the ones nearest to hearth and home. The halflings just don't feel a need to surround themselves with too many shared gods. Truth to tell, the little folk have heaps of powers known as the Thousand Small Gods, who aren't really much more than spirits of the local land, if they're even that. Their so-called powers are usually in charge of minor aspects of life, such as the successful repair of a door or a chair, or the perfection of a well-cooked roast. These aren't matters that a regular deity likes to be bothered with, and it's why the halflings venerate the local spirits rather than the vast powers of their race. They just don't like to bother them. Don't think of the halflings as shying away from religion, it's just that they don't want to bother the powers with petty details, and besides, the local gods seem very much more concerned with the cares and concerns of each individual village, and it seems that it pays dividends. Some adventurers sneer that the halflings are small because they dream small, but that's not true. Just because most halflings don't appreciate the joys of adventuring, they prefer to stay at home and nurture their race, doesn't mean that they've got no ambition. The halflings have as much spirit and smug as the rest of the races, and it's sure to rise to the surface if they're ever provoked. As the head of the pantheons, Yondala chose Mount Celestia as the place to centre the halfling powers in the pleasant realm of Greenfields, on Venia, the third layer of the celestial heavens. The halfling petitioners while away their existence in peaceful meditation and hard work, well, it's more like putting their feet up in a hammock after some hard work, enjoying the fruits of their labours and the company of their fellows. Greenfields is home to Yondala, Arvorin, and Karulili, who watch over their shared domain with a careful eye and an ear to what folks are saying. They want to make sure that Greenfields is truly a place of safety and repose. They've done a fine job too, and anybody who harms a halfling here suffers identical wounds, and that keeps away the most vicious and vindictive and troublemaking people. The realm's basically a collection of halfling settlements on a slope of Mount Celestia that stretches away in all different directions. The best known burgs or villages include Amberwell, Bunbury Hills, Candlewood, Marsden on Water, Thistledowns and Turtle Creek. The homes that dot the mountainside are built both above and below ground in typical halfling fashion and the powers themselves wander freely, seeing that all runs smoothly and making themselves available to their people, kind of like well-beloved town mares. In short, Greenfields is a realm of equality and freedom, 
and you'd do well to remember that that's what the halflings value most highly of anything in their lives. The halfling pantheon's got none of the rivalries that you might expect. It holds no great powers of evil. There's no great drama within their own their own pantheon. The halflings look to other races for that. Indeed, their gods tend to work together so smoothly, sharing their portfolios and interests in order to present a unified front. That's what they do to get the big folk to take them seriously. The halflings unify and put on a show of force to let them know that they're not to be trifled with. And that's exactly what the halfling gods do as well. Every power in the Pantheon takes threats to halfling well-being seriously, and they have no compunction about sending groups of avatars to defend their people's villages, or including sending celestial hosts down to help when summoned. They've learned to show a force is often the best way to frighten off enemies. Yondala herself has given plenty of gifts to her worshippers, not the least of which is her temperament. From her, the halflings have learned to stand up for themselves, to defend their homes and families, and to seek peaceable solutions or else to turn their foes if it's against each other, and slip away unnoticed. Yondala is a charming and persuasive power of peace, and though she can take life and health as easily as she gives it, she never seeks out opportunities to harm those who don't richly deserve it. But her vengeance is terrible. Arvareen is a fiery guardian of the home, and he firmly believes in an active defence. He urges his charges to keep their burrows secure and to be ready in case of attack, and to put down danger before it even rears its head. Though Arverine stops short of advocating war, he's not shy about pointing out folks who are acting suspiciously, and after all, they might just be evil in disguise. To this end, Arverine spends most of his time in Greenfields drilling elite troops of halfling warrior spirits called the Keepers, who protect the Greenfields. The god isn't exactly a popular power, but he is respected and revered for his teachings. It's from him that the halflings learn to construct elaborate systems of defense and tricks and traps to defuse enemy charges. And it's from him that they learn that someone who gives aid against a mutual foe is a friend to be rewarded and trusted. Brandabaris is a power of thievery and trickery. He figures that life's there to be explored, and so it's it's a favourite among the small adventuring class of halflings. It's little wonder that he's usually portrayed as a young adventurer who hasn't yet learned the ways of true living in halfling fashion. Still, he's beloved for his mischievous ways, his revelling and his joking and his ability to escape from any scrape, no matter how dangerous. So this is the tales of the, uh, the plucky warrior who gets out by his wits. Although he's good friends with both Gaal Glittergold and Bear Van Wildwanderer, Brandabaris doesn't have a realm in the Golden Hills, or anywhere else for that matter. He usually spends his time wandering through other powers' realms, halfling or not, seeing what he can see, and it's said that he occasionally seeks out mortals to adventure with. Carolali is a power of the home and the hearth. Carolali is also a gentle protector of the halflings. However, whereas Yondala's concern lies with the overall race, Carolali cares more for the sanctity of the home itself. Her real interest is in the hospitality, generosity, and kindness of halflings that they show to each other and to others. Naturally, she hates liars, people who steal, and especially cross-traders who break into a, somebody's home and burgle them. Karula Lee doesn't get too involved in the day-to-day -day lives of her followers except on a small level, watching over the everyday events of the home. However, she's keenly aware of what the faithful do, and if roused, she can be a most fearsome foe indeed. Any halfling whose burrow has been violated knows the feeling of Corolla's fury swelling within them. Sheila Puri Royal is a quiet one. She's rarely seen without a smile on her face and a dancer in her eyes. She's concerned with nature and agriculture and how to maintain the balance between the two. The druids need to preserve wild growth is just as important as the farmers need to till the fields, and Sheila's the one who tries to see that they both get what they want she will instruct them that sometimes it is best to leave a field fallow and to return to the wild to be replenished before it can be cultivated again through farming. She's also concerned with the pleasures of life, feasts, revelry, romance, and a general desire to live with passion. Her petitioners feel the same way. They all want to learn to live like the deity, and they welcome anyone who can teach them the path. In her realm, the Flowering Hill, it consists of a single orchard and a wide farm, and her petitioners work in both sites learning how to appease nature and their bellies at the same time. They're an open and friendly sort, but they also get an awful lot of travellers going through their territory as they make their way up the challenging heights of Mount Celestia in their personal journeys of uh, self-growth. Thus, they're careful and watchful, but also welcoming. 
Erogalan, sometimes known as he who must be, is the, well, he's the god of their afterlife. The halfling view of life is so gentle and optimistic that even their view of death is seen as more of a respected and revered transition, never to be feared. Erogalan is seen as a protector of the dead, not as a judge, and he's pleased to play this role. Folks who die are usually buried in the soil, and Erugalan embodies reverence for the earth itself and for the promise that it holds. It's restful place. Fittingly, his realm is a cavern beneath the fields of Aronia, but it's not filled with petitioners looking to merge with their power and stay there. Rather, they're inhabiting the place, waiting to be sorted and sent on to the proper places in the plains for their afterlife. It's not horrifying, it just is. Now let's take a closer look at the finer points of halfling culture in general and a little secret that was revealed to me by a, pa a uh, member on the Discord channel called Mason. So shout out to Mason, thank you very much for pointing this out to me today. Let's turn to uh, the Wikipedia article first, we'll get this out of the way, and talk about Dlaren, also known as Ice Steel. It's a non-natural white metal that is unknown to most peoples of Faerun. It's a closely held secret of halflings. The good folk are quite secretive about their knowledge of Dalaran, often giving misleading descriptions or feigning ignorance if it was ever brought up in conversation, although it's quite often worn as a badge or an amulet, or sometimes they have armour and weapons made out of it. This lightweight metal is bone white in colour, with a high polish that shines green when illuminated by candles or magical sources of light. Considering it was more of an esoteric substance, it can easily be mistaken for ivory and not metal at all. It's that white. Dalaran is often used in the creation of small figurines, engraved plates, or the pommels of weapons, often in the shape of an acorn, a claw, or some symbol of nature. It's also used to make um, pipe weeds, smoking pipes. If a piece of magical jewellery or other decorative item made from Dalaran came into contact with a wearer's skin, it will often confer to the wearer a limited ability for them to see through illusions and to ignore certain psychic effects. Armour crafted from the metal offered limited protection from fire, and weapons with it, made from it, can strike with an icy frost. So, yeah, it takes on a sort of a cold property quite easily. This unique metal is not suited for the creation of items that are intended to carry an enchantment related to flame, such as flame tongue. It just rejects the enchantment. Followers of Arugalan sometimes give unworked Dlaren as offerings during the Earth Rising ceremony, and some priests of He Who Must Be... Uh, use the statuette or of a hound made of Dlaren as their holy symbol. The formation of Dlaren involving, uh, involves digging up a clay from certain riverbeds located throughout Faerun, heating them up in a crucible and mixing the resulting white flakes with certain oils. The soft malleable metal is then heated again in a fire whose fuel includes specific secret elements. Turning to page 77, reading directly from the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons 2nd edition sourcebook titled The Complete Book of Gnomes and Halflings by Douglas Niles, let's have a look at halfling culture in some detail. To the halflings, the primary symbol of the importance of home, family and community is the burrow and its ever-present hearth fire. No halfling dwelling will be without some sort of fireplace, and even halflings who live above ground tend to refer to their dwelling as a burrow. Even if they're staying at an inn, they'll refer to their room at the inn as a burrow. <laughs> While burrows will naturally vary somewhat depending on the climate and terrain and the sub-race and the specific tribe of halflings in general, a Furchin's ice house for, will, for example, differ significantly from an Athasian halfling's treehouse. All halfling dwellings have some features in common, if at all possible, there will be windows, which will be open during all but the chilliest of days. Halflings never confuse snug with stuffy. Tall fellows carry this fondness for fresh air to the farthest extreme, positioning their homes to take advantage of whatever natural gentle breezes wafts through the area, while stouts represent the opposite extreme and might well have only a few small window openings, more like portholes, that let in a, um, a bit of fresh air. Although well ventilated, the burrow will be shielded against drafts with shutters of wood or leather that can be tightly closed and sealed against gusts and storms. Unlike dwarves, halflings keep their homes brightly lit, with lamps in every room. Yet shutters and doors will be well set into their frames and not a glimmer of illumination will show on the outside when the burrow is locked up tight. The fireplace will be built with as much stone as possible, given materials at hand, and capped with a large wooden mantle. It will have a wide mouth and a well-designed chimney to draw smoke up and out of the room. In colder climates, elaborate fireplaces are sometimes constructed with their own air inlet ducts and connected to the outside of the burrow. 
allowing the house to be snugly sealed up without suffocating the fire, while other ducts channel the heated air away to more usefully heat the home. Conversely, in very warm locales, halflings enjoy gathering around communal outdoor fires for an evening's conversation and fellowship. They're the masters of barbecue. Even so, each individual burrow will always have its own home fire as well. It's not uncommon for a halfling burrow for a single fire to last for years, even decades or generations, without a second kindling. Even in very warm climes that are where it's allowed to die down to coals during the daylight hours, the embers are coaxed back to life at nightfall. Well-seasoned hardwoods are a favoured fuel, but wherever they live, halflings will quickly learn the best fuels for producing a warm, steady heat. Out on the steps, they'll use chunks of condensed uh, buffalo dung, for instance. Halflings are adept at using different local firewoods such as hickory, mesquite, uh, applewood, etc. to sweeten the air or season the food they cook. A halfling's fireplace usually has several racks inside it so that a variety of cauldrons and kettles can be swung over the coals. In this way dinners are cooked, milk curdled into cheese and clay pottery fired by the steady heat. Often a large oven nestles in one corner of the coal bed for use in baking bread and the bread forms the centerpiece of the halfling diet. Halflings have been called connoisseurs of comfort, and the interior of a burrow will be furnished as cosily as the inhabitants can afford. The floor will boast several rugs, mats or carpets, and every halfling, however poor, has a table and a few stools, and at least one well-padded, comfortable chair. The bed will be small but snug, its mattress filled with clean straw, or will sometimes down with several soft pillows. The mantelpiece will feature a wide variety of decorations, mostly practical, like dishes and candlesticks, but a few ornamental or exotic items, usually among the owner's prized possessions, even if they don't know exactly what they are, provided they look interesting enough, and quite often have a story attached to them, usually attached to an ancestor or relative. Paintings and statuary are rare, as halflings generally prefer their treasures to be useful as well as pretty to look at, and quite often small and uncluttered. A single burrow will be occupied by members of one family. Depending on the size of both the burrow and the family, the dwelling could have as many as 25 residents, or as few as just one. A populous burrow will have a patriarch or matriarch, usually both, which presides over the brood with genial authority. Four generations of the family living in a burrow is not at all uncommon, although sometimes a just married couple will decide to they'll want a burrow of their own. Occasionally, an older halfling will decide that he or she would like a private burrow, but such individuals are viewed as eccentrics by their family and neighbours. It's hard for most of the gregarious folk to imagine anyone wanting to be alone. Halflings respect experience and wisdom and defer to their elders out of affection and trust. Aside from the venerable head of a family, adult halflings of different generations, even parents and children, view each other as equals. Only the youngest halflings, not yet adults, are subject to rules and restraints imposed by authority. All grown halflings living in the burrow will be there because they want to be there. Parenting duties are shared by all the adult members of the family. Fathers and mothers, uncles, aunts, grandparents and older siblings all share in the upbringing of youngsters. It's a rare halfling who grows up as the only child in the household. It's more common to be one of a number of brothers and sisters and cousins who play and explore together. Though family bonds are felt warmly, they are not a cause for exclusivity. Feuds between clans are rare since most disputes are blamed on the disputers themselves, not their family. For example, if a halfling who gets into a fight, which is rare, rare but not unheard of, is likely to be criticised soundly by his or her own family for his or her lack of self-control. There's no let's go and whoop them guys who beat up on my brother mentality. Although disagreements are naturally inevitable in these crowded living conditions, halflings rarely engaged in outright bickering or argument. For the one thing, it's considered extremely rude in their culture. It's a breach of etiquette in the living conditions, um, frowned on by everybody, because nobody wants to live in a home where people are arguing. Many of the traditional causes of such fights amongst humans are removed from the halfling's communal outlook on life. Supper is prepared by everyone who has a free hand, and those who didn't cook will pitch in with the cleaning up or help entertain youngsters after the meal. Only when all the chores are done is an individual member free to go about his or her business. Because of their ready to help nature tasks like cooking and cleaning usually don't take very long so this still leaves family members with plenty of time to get their feet up and their eyelids down in the cases of deeper disputes such as couples disagreements on whether to move out and find a place of their own 
the discussion will generally be waged quietly over a period of months or even years. One member might make a friendly remark after a crowded dinner around a small table how pleasant it would be to have enough room to stretch out his elbows at the table. A week later, his spouse might reply in an equally pleasant tone, how nice it is that there was such an interesting interesting conversation, so many points of view around that same table on a different evening. (laughs) Naturally, it takes a long time to resolve an issue like this, but when it's resolved, the decision will be far more likely to have been mutually arrived at rather than it would have been among a human couple. Offspring are a source of great pride and a joy to their parents. Halflings enter the world as helpless as human infants, requiring a similar level of care for the early part of their lives. For the first 10 years, a halfling's relative growth pretty well parallels a human's. They um, basically look like a 10-year-old. The halfling will look much the same age, though obviously not in size, and will have about the same level of maturity. Children of both genders and many different ages communally play together, following rules created by older youths that still allow the youngest a measure of freedom and decision-making in the game. Essentially, they travel around as large gangs of siblings and cousins. It's during these formative years that young halflings practice those traits that will form some of the basic skills when they grow up. Hide-and-seek is a favourite game among halflings and is almost always played outdoors. Thus, the youngsters become adept at concealing themselves in all sorts of natural cover, in patches of brush, behind tree trunks, and even amid beds of flowers. Young halflings quickly develop the calm patience that allows them to remain still for long periods of time, since they learn over and over that's the one who moves that is seen first. Another favourite is called Knock the Block, in which a small object such as a block of wood or perhaps a tin pot or an iron kettle is placed some distance away, and the young halflings take turns throwing things at it, recording points for hits. The game is sometimes played with slings and stones among the older youths. For special tournaments and important matches, clay targets are used, with the winner determined by whoever's shot strikes hard enough to shatter the object. This common game is presumably one reason why so many halflings are so good with missile weapons. From the age of 11 or so to adulthood, halfling development slows in comparison with the big folk. A halfling's adolescent years last for a decade and a half, more in the case of the longer-lived sub-races. However, this period is characterized by a lot less angst than is typical of a human, perhaps because of the warm, supportive, non-competing environment provided by family, borough, and community. Halfling youths are encouraged to travel around different halfling artisans and craftsmen that do follow a form of apprenticeship with them. Indeed, adolescents are encouraged to experiment with a wide variety of pursuits until they find something they like. The cheesemaker, for example, will be helped by virtually every youth over the course of several years. Then those who find that form of employment the most enjoyable will spend more and more time with the master until adulthood and youth has left and they are learning everything about the cheesemaking art that they could possibly learn. Another reason perhaps for the relaxed adolescence of the typical halfling is that The male-female relationships are as common as in friendship as between members of the same sex, often lasting from childhood through adulthood, and many of these lifelong friendships culminate in marriages. Halflings enjoy eating and drinking in plentiful quantities. Despite the difference in size, the typical halfling would eat as much, if not more, than a human twice his or her size. This is because halflings have a very high metabolism. Most halflings eat three large meals a day interspersed with three sizable snacks, So breakfast, brunch, lunch, tea time, supper, and bedtime snack. Although they enjoy an occasional meal of meat, especially poultry or wildfowl, such as roast pheasant, which is considered a delicacy, the short folk rely extensively on bread, fruit, and cheese. Halfling bakers are famed for their abilities with dough, making all types of sweet or salty, light or heavy breads. Cheese making is another skill in which many halflings are proficient, and here too a variety is a prime hallmark. Each individual cheesemaker will typically specialise in one kind of cheese, no two of which will be alike, allowing a halfling community to offer a variety of sharp and hard, mild and soft cheeses. Halflings are born gardeners, far exceeding any other race in their knack for growing foodstuffs. Any halfling with access to a plot of ground will usually maintain a garden, wherein he will have carefully nurtured fruits and vegetables of all types appropriate to the climate. Even in a small garden, a halfling will generally plant as many different times during the spring, assuring a continual harvest from early summer through to late autumn. Halflings do not favour a lot of spice in their foods. However, so few raise 
peppers or other strongly flavoured crops unless a nearby ready market for them exists. Onions are a notable exception. Many halflings love them and have been known to munch them raw, much like a human might munch on an apple. Halfling brewers are well known and their products popular with humans as well as other halflings. As with cheese making, a brewer will specialise in a single beverage. These can vary from a heavy stout, halflings often jokingly hand a first time human drinker a knife and fork with the glass so thick as their stout, to light and creamy ales. Fruit wines are also popular with halfling vintners specialising in using the whatever fruit is nearby to hand. It should be noted that although halflings favour many sorts of wines and ales, they rarely get drunk due no doubt to their high metabolism, rather the alcohol tends to make them pleasantly drowsy and a group of halflings that share a bottle of potent stuff will typically become quite relaxed, quiet and contented as the evening wears on. The key to the village is the halflings desire for the maximum of comfort with the minimum of effort. These pragmatic folk long ago learned that, though one halfling might learn to grow and cook and sew and build and so forth, specialisation in these tasks creates a much higher level of quality all around. Thus, we see the create cooperative roots of the halfling's picture of community. Indeed, this cooperative nature extends to all their aspects of life. The bread maker will give his or her loaves to other villagers, as will the cheese maker, as with their cheese and the brewer with their beverages, plus the baker's family gets the best loaf from a particular batch, but everything else is fair and everyone gets an equal share. Brower excavation and house building operates under the same pattern. The most experienced builder in the town will supervise a legion of workers so that the initial portions of the task can be accomplished in a few days. As the furnishing of the burrow, the occupants see that to that themselves and that's where carpentry and trade and barter comes in. Though halflings mingle well with human society, this is, doesn't mean they have departed from the concept of the village. Rather, it's an indication of their broad vision for nowhere is it written that the village must be villagers must be fellow halflings. A halfling who dwells in the city will treat his or her neighbours as fellow villagers. This is what makes halflings much better neighbours than anybody else. They're quick to recognise when generosity is not reciprocated, however, and will soon narrow their circle of villagers to those who feel a similar sense of cooperation and friendship. So travelling to your halfling neighbour's house with a loaf of bread and saying hello is a very good idea. Halflings are adept at utilising local resources in their labours, although only the stouts are very effective at mining, all subraces will be familiar with the surface features of their surroundings. If they live in an area with a lot of trees, carvers will know everything about each variety of wood available. If the environment is rocky, experienced stonemasons will be predominant. The most dramatic evidence, perhaps, of this adaptability is the fact that the Furchin had developed a high level of skill at working the raw materials of their nearby woodless and stoneless environment. They make everything from uh, in their home, their tools, weapons and clothing out of leather, bone and ice. The specific skills likely to be found in the halfling community vary by their subrace. The quality of halfling work is very consistent. While rarely the equal of the greatest artisans in the world, Dwarves make better axe blades, elves make better wine. On average, it's better than the average available elsewhere. Areas where halfling craftsmen truly excel include many tasks involving dexterity and great detail. The small folk make splendid jewellers, engravers, locksmiths, woodcarvers, and indeed artisans of all types. They love colours, and once again, the propensity for detail allows the halfling painter to bring a scene to life through vivid and bright colour. If clocks are known in the world, then it's likely that the finest clockmakers will be halflings. Also, because of their proclivity for entertaining gossip and news of all kinds, halflings make great storytellers. Most of them have a gift for music, and halfling musicians and storytellers are in great demand in any village, festival, or hall. Halflings are ill-suited for jobs requiring size and strength, such as blacksmithing, ocean sailing or cargo hauling. Though a halfling village will usually have a smith who makes nails and horseshoes, his or her work will not be up to the same level of most human smiths and will be for local consumption only. Barter is a way of life to the halfling, although in most cases, more cases than not, it's unspoken, unrecorded barter of village life. However, halflings also trade amongst themselves on a more formal basis and are skilled at interacting with human suppliers and customers. They have a keen eye for detail and are generally quick to spot counterfeit or low quality goods while all the while proclaiming the good points of whatever they're offering in return. 
Since they enjoy the give and take of a good bartering session, a typical halfling merchant will offer far less for goods than he or she desires than they're actually worth, while at the same time asking an exorbitant price for his or her own. The small folk view bartering as something of a game and sometimes forget how much better they are at it than most of the big folk. However, a halfling who belatedly discovers that he or she has unwittingly talked a human into buying goods at a considerably more than their value will often salve his or her conscience by throwing in bonus items once the deal is closed to compensate the poor bargainer and also maintain goodwill. Although they have no lack of courage, halflings shun violent or aggressive behaviour in social settings. They are slow to anger and always seek to negotiate a solution to any dispute. A halfling feels no shame if he or she chooses to leave the presence of an obnoxious bully rather than getting involved in a fight, even a fight the halfling thinks he or she will win. Fortunately, because of their communal villagey upbringing, few halflings are this rude, and such situations mainly arise when the halfling mixes company with humans, dwarves, or goblinoids. Personal insults delivered to a fellow villager are considered low class, reflecting more poorly on the one who makes the insult than the target. Politeness is much more admired and one who shows tolerance to a neighbour who has wronged him is considered to be the epitome of a class act. Parties amongst halflings are common and will be given for a variety of reasons. Birthdays are always a cause for celebration and with so many family members living together it's rare for a month to go by without several birthdays in it. Each community will also have many annual holidays but these vary by each individual village. There's no general holidays shared by all. Often the small folk will celebrate whatever festivals are popular among the human and demi-human neighbours, soon giving these observances a characteristic all of their own. The hosts of a party are expected to provide food and drink. Much of this will be contributed by neighbours prior to the event anyway. <laughs> Thus none of the guests show up with anything to contribute as they're all provided for with a bottle, a wedge of cheese, a loaf of bread or the like beforehand. Indeed, it's this is one way halflings get invited to parties. If you find out that your neighbour is celebrating his birthday, for example, take over a small jug of ale in the morning and he can hardly turn you away when the festivities commence in the afternoon. So <laughs> you've already pre-bought your invitation to the party. There is little sense of social status among the halflings in a village, aside from the amused tolerance shown by adults to children and the general respect for the elderly. Wealthy halflings are expected to throw bigger parties and to generally show generosity to those less fortunate. They are not accorded any upper class standing because of this. The villagers will elect a sheriff, a mayor, a constable and give this individual nominal authorities to arrest troublemakers. Rumbunctious behaviour is rare among halflings themselves. However, so the sheriff's little will be, main concern will be control of the behaviour of humans, dwarves and other possible troublemakers who come through their community. And they're generally backed up because they're respected and given that task for a reason. Halflings are a folk who derive pleasure from many simple things and are not afraid to show it. A halfling who is happy laughs. One who feels affection or love will express himself or herself with words or deeds. The small folk love to tell and hear stories and will generally be attentive and silent when anyone spins a tale. Not surprisingly, they especially love stories in which the small and clever triumph over those who are physically larger and stronger but clumsier and less quick-witted. You can always get a halfling's attention with those sort of stories. Halflings also have a frank appreciation for bawdy humour and practical jokes, it has to be said. They have the ability to laugh at themselves, although one prank often leads to another in retaliation and so on. It really gets out of hand. Such good-natured exchanges have been known to continue un well, reciprocated back and forth for decade after decade. <laughs> Happiness aside, the small folk do know the same griefs as humankind, death and illness, partings and natural disasters and other tragedies. Though they are, as a people, deeply affected by such misfortune, halflings tend not to display their grief openly as do humans. Halfling villagers who have lost several neighbours and friends to marauding bandits will shuffle around as if they're in shock. There will be few tears, little wailing or crying. Even more surprisingly, there will be few expressions of outright anger or hostility. Revenge is not a great drive for most halflings, though occasionally a wrong will be judged so heinous, so unforgivable that retribution is required. Deliberate murder of one of their members, family members is a prime example. Loss of possessions, however, whether due to accident or malicious acts of others, tends to be greeted with a more relaxed attitude of, well, easy come, easy go, we made that stuff ourselves anyway, it can be replaced. In the day-to-day -day lives, halflings are remarkably impervious to frustrations and depression. 
Members of the small folk show a remarkable ability to adapt to circumstances of their surroundings. If the crops fail and food is short, they derive that much more pleasure from the meagre fare that they eat. And if the roof caves in and the family has no place to sleep, they'll remark how fortunate they were that no one was seriously hurt, and they mean it. A favourite form of contest among halflings and all subraces is the exchange of riddles. This can vary from simple questions and answers to complex riddles involving clues and vague and obtuse ones. It's not uncommon for a halfling to spend an hour or more pondering such a problem in silence, punctuated only by his or her frequent admonitions. Don't tell me the answer! Even more baffling to non-halflings is the question game, a contest in which each participant must answer a question with another question. Each response must be a complete sentence relevant to the one that preceded it and delivered within 10 seconds, or the player loses a point. Experienced players can continue the game for hours. One legendary brother and sister team are rumoured to have carried a game on every time they met for the last 20 years of their lives. Some halflings enthusiasts of the game will treat every question addressed to them as an invitation to play with sometimes regrettable results. Halfling settlements for the most part tend to remain small. They will live in towns and shires scattered throughout a human empire. For example, they might occupy several small villages in a forest ruled by an elven king. In a few cases, halfling holdings have expanded to the size of a kingdom. Both the Forgotten Realms and Kryn boast nations populated and ruled entirely by halflings. Lurin is a prime example. But even here, they have laboured to maintain peaceable relations with realms that share their borders. As you can guess, halflings prefer to avoid war at all costs, if at all possible. A community of the small folk will be willing to negotiate extensively and even yield to a certain amount of extortion in order to avoid bloodshed. However, when pressed to the point of no return, halfling troops make determined fighters with a number of effective tactics at their command. In most cases, only about half the adults will fight, the remainder remaining behind to protect the elderly and the children. In cases of dire need, where the very survival of the community is at stake, every able-bodied adult will be able to be drafted into the cause. Halflings have a reputation for being easygoing and somewhat lazy, but this does not mean that they cannot fight effectively if they need to. The legends of the bad old days remind every halfling of what life was like before they had villages and lands of their own, and they will fight with surprising tenacity, even ferocity, to keep from slipping back into that fugitive existence. Thus each halfling has something that can be used as a weapon in his or her burrow, no matter how peaceful the area. If the halfling has to fight in the recent past, then each resident will have a sword, short sword and a shield, as well as a bow and arrows or sling and bullets within their home. Even if the battle is rare or virtually non-existent, villagers will be able to arm themselves with a missile weapon pretty quickly, and at least a long knife or a spear for melee combat. A fact invaders expecting to find them easy prey have discovered time and again, to their surprise and regret. Halfling companies are almost always irregular. They don't fight in neat ranks and lines. They will be quite capable of firing volleys of missile fire upon command, and they will advance and withdraw on the orders of their captains, but they would have a hard time facing, for example, a tight rank of armoured human infantry or orcish swords. They'll scatter and resort to guerrilla warfare instead. The halflings favour battles in woodland or otherwise obstructed terrain. This scattered formation is ideal for each fighter finding his or her own source of cover, though they are far more adept than humans at holding their company's unity, even in thickets where visibility and mobility are severely limited. The fabled ability of halflings to virtually disappear in underbrush is never more useful at moments like this, and how they maintain contact with each other is anybody else's guess. A favoured tactic of halfling forces when fighting in this type of terrain is the loud diversion. A few veteran warriors will thrash their brush, firing many arrows, giving the impression they are a number of times more than they actually do. Then, if the opponent force turns to face this imaginary onslaught, the real halfling company, screened by the woods, attacks the enemy's flank, taking them out at the angles. If a halfling force is attacked in unfavourable open terrain by a force of large creatures, the small folk might try to stand off the attack if they feel they have a chance of success. If they're attacked by horsemen or are outnumbered by well-armoured infantry, however, the entire formation will usually scatter, joining again in a place offering more concealment and protection. They do have a famous formation where they form up and bristle their spears in the direction of the uh, charging foe. 
Halflings rarely fight mounted, although the tall fellows are notable exceptions with their uh, small ponies, or very rarely beasts such as dire wolves, and in some circumstances halflings have been known to ride uh, large dogs, but they don't do that in combat typically. When halflings fight as members of an alliance, they are often used as missile troops, well screened behind formations of human or dwarven foot soldiers. Halfling archers and slingers can shower their enemy with a deadly rain of arrows and bullets, and they are justifiably feared for doing so. Another common specialty of halfling troops is tunneling and underground operations, much like gnomes. They're not particularly adept at digging such passages, these tasks are better left to dwarves, but halfling troops can negotiate such passages much better than can most of their allies. Thus, if combat is expected in close quarters or beneath a low ceiling, halfling troops are often selected to lead the way. Finally, magic. Halflings aren't particularly skilled magicians, just traditionally. Uh, Perhaps it's their reliance on an oral tradition and their lack of keeping books and things in their homes, but it just sort of, their culture doesn't tend to lead that way. Although, of course, there are exceptions to the norm, and there are many halfling adventurers who distinguish themselves with their ability with the arcane arts. Almost all halflings suffer some degree from feelings which resembles the conditions humans call agoraphobia, a fear of unknown or open spaces. It's not that halflings are literally afraid, they're quite famously unafraid, merely that they become very uncomfortable whenever they're too far away from the villages and burrows and unfamiliar places. Whether this is one of Yondala's gifts designed to keep them close to home and hearth, or a holdover from the bad old days when enemies lurked behind every tree and bush, none can say. But it has been observed that the symptoms increase with age. Halfling children freely range far and wide, while the very old rarely step outside their burrows. Not that halflings see this as a bad thing, to them it's simply the way things are and ought to be. Youth is the time to adventure about and see the world, and age is the time for rest and reflection. So I guess you'd ask, if their burrow and its attendant company and comforts are the most important features of a halfling's life, why then would the halfling leave that perfection to go into a life of short rations, crude lodging, exposure to bad weather, danger and possible violence? That's the question asked by most of the village when a young halfling packs their bags and waves goodbye to their parents. And their neighbours will often gather to see the would-be adventurer off, watching their retreating form knowing there's a good chance that they'll never see their friend again. There are nearly as many answers to this question as there are halflings who have walked down that road. Some do so reluctantly out of a sense of duty. Others find the temptation of excitement, adventure and treasure too great to ignore. One thing almost all of them share in common however is that they lack the characteristic halfling dread of faraway places. For reasons which once again are unknown, halflings call it the legacy of little man. A few rare halflings are born entirely free of the condition that keeps their fellows tied to their homes. Instead, they're filled with an endless curiosity to see new places, new people, and new things. Usually, this wanderlust fades later in life, and the the homing instinct reasserts itself. But a few halflings remain wanderers for the rest of their days. These restless individuals are considered eccentric by their fellow halflings, but their exploits are often admired just the same. And that pretty much covers it for halfling cultural values and their religion, such as it is in this video. I'll be making a subsequent follow-up video talking about specific groups of halflings in, across the different worlds of the multiverse of Dungeons and & Dragons. And there I'll be talking about some of the weird and wild varieties of their tribes and cultures across different planets. If you enjoyed this video, give us a thumbs up, consider subscribing to the channel, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos, buy some merchandise if you will, and wear your geek with pride. And as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon. 